Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel we've got Mayo Clinic. Yes, we have Mayo Clinic on a video that they posted called Reversing Heart Disease, Mayo Clinic Radio. Didn't know they even had a radio station. It may just be some little special thing to do for their YouTube channel, not sure. But we're going to go ahead and just jump right into this because typically the medical establishment does not know what they're talking about. Actually, invariably, that's the case. So we're going to jump in and see what they have to say about heart disease and I'm ready to get pissed. As you guys should know by now, no supplements need to be taken on a carnivore diet as you can derive everything you need from such a diet. However, this does not mean that there aren't certain nutraceuticals that can be taken to further ameliorate inflammation and subsequently any illness, disorder, and or disease someone may be plagued with. One of the best products on the market, if not the best product, in doing such a thing is the flagship product to a company known as Cerule, known as Stem Enhance Ultra, which effectuates the release of one's own inherent stem cells from their bone marrow. When this occurs, this results in what may be perceived by some to be the epitome of regeneration. Now, I cannot under any circumstances claim any cause and effect relationships from this product and any heart health outcome. However, one may speculate what they wish with this information. If you want to know more about this product or are interested in buying this product, as well as many others from the Cerule Company, refer to the link on the screen now or the description below. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, as you know, there are millions of people in this country with heart disease. In fact, it's the number one killer of both men and women. Yes, correct. In fact, according to the EPA, from the course of time between 2002 to 2018, the prevalence of cardiovascular disease has remained relatively stagnant at 111 cases per 1,000 adults. So we're not really improving at all. So yes, people are continuing to die from such a very easily avoidable disease, in fact. Yes. And the majority of those people have CAD, or coronary artery disease. And that's when the major blood vessels that supply the muscles of your heart, uh, they supply blood, they supply nutrients, they supply, uh, supply oxygen. And yes, they also supply cholesterol, which is important for this process. In fact, in ameliorating such a process, actually. Cholesterol is extremely important for the human body. As you'll see, they're going to disparage and denigrate cholesterol, which is something that is so facile, it's infuriatingly anachronistic and antiquated. But anyway, let's continue become damaged or diseased, it's called coronary artery disease. Yes, it's underpinned by inflammation, Tom. We'll get into that. And that, of course, is usually the result of cholesterol-containing deposits. False. Technically correct, but your insinuation is false that cholesterol is the primary constituent. In fact, one-tenth of one percent of atherosclerotic plaque consists of cholesterol, and it is largely composed of scar tissue that can become calcified at later stages, then causing thrombi, which are blood clots. Scar tissue is largely composed of collagen, in fact. Think of a callus on your foot or your hand that you can develop. That is not necessarily a scarring, but it is also composed primarily or constituted primarily of collagen. I say think of a callus, though, because calluses are formed due to abrasions called plaque, along with a little inflammation, and it, it... No, not along with other inflammation, Tom. Inflammation is the underpinning etiology of heart disease. A process that we know as atherosclerosis. When the plaque builds up, it narrows your coronary... Yep, get your canned speech out. Get your canned set-up little intro out. ...and that decreases the blood flow to your heart. If no it... shit, Tracy. That can cause symptoms that you might recognize, chest pain, shortness of breath, a complete blockage can even cause a heart attack. And we know there's lots of things that you can do to prevent heart disease, but what about reversing the damage that has already been done? It yes, reversing the damage and preventing the disease. Prevention is the best cure in the first place, but yes, you can reverse already pre-existing heart disease given the right indicated, proper, appropriate methods for human physiology. You don't even need to be that adroit. It's pretty basic, in fact. But let's get into what you believe, or rather, what Stephen Kopecki here believes are the most auspicious, propitious approaches in ameliorating such a condition. Let's go ahead and see. Not possible. Let's find out from a Mayo Clinic preventive cardiologist, Dr. Stephen Kopetsky. Okay, let me ask you something real quick. Why are we asking physicians what the most proper indicated approach is at ameliorating certain pre-existing conditions and or preventing conditions or such conditions from arising or forming and developing? May we remember, and lest we forget, what physicians are trained in. They are trained in two things effectively, pharmacology and effectively symptomology. They are not trained in biochemistry, anatomy, paleoanthropology, or how to in infer judicious inferences from paleoanthropology. They're not trained in even remotely any physics, which depending on what area of human nutrition science you're trying to look at or observe, particularly calories or the usage and relevance of calories in diet, you need to know physics. They're not trained in any of this. So once again, I iterate this question. Why are we asking Dr. Stephen Kopecki? Welcome back to the program. 
Thank you for having me. Dr. Kopetsky, good to see you. You know, I've once heard you say that you wanted to start a- No, it's not good to see him. Very artery disease reversal clinic, suggesting that in fact, if your coronary arteries were diseased, you could make them better. Yes, very clearly you can. Yes, patently, demonstrably you can, Stephen, given the right indicated approach. Let's see if you know what those are. The clinic, we just don't call it that, unfortunately. <laughs> no, you don't have the clinic, actually. What you have are perpetuators of sickness and illness. I'm eyeing one down the road. You have names for those, though. Those are called hospitals, where people go to die and to fill your pockets. But the data, the studies have shown you can reverse. Studies have shown the most trite, banal phrase ever. Do you know how to interpret science? How dare you say studies have shown? Do you know what they've shown? Or do you know what the conclusions that were written by authors and our opinions, therefore, by authors have shown or demonstrated to show unequivocally and unambiguously within the studies that they are opining about or opining upon? Is that what you know and what abstracts say? Yeah, I think so disease, you can reverse this narrowing of the arteries to the heart. As you mentioned, inflammation or the irritation of the lining of the artery. Irritation is a vast oversimplification. In order to be informal, I understand espousing it in that way and framing it to be such a thing. But it's not simply irritation. It is an immune response. Inflammation is a pre-programmed response within the body when it has perceived damage to tissues or potential invading pathogen. Very important to reduce because that's what actually causes the blood clot to form and the heart attack to occur. Correct. I mean, you could say that, yes, the clotting of the blood is what is the result of inflammation, but in many cases, the blocking, which people use interchangeably, clot and blocking, which they're two different things. The blocking, if you're referring to that, that is not caused by inflammation per se. It's caused by the scar tissue buildup, which, yes, is consequent of inflammation, but I think it's important to specify that. Get the inflammation in the first place. Good question, Tom. Let's see if Stephen gets any of this f***ing correct. That's a great question. There great question, Stephen. Answer it. Things that cause inflammation. Smoking. Yes, smoking causes inflammation. Correct. Got it. Good. Blood pressure. High blood pressure. Good. Correct. High blood pressure being basically invariably for all intents and purposes caused by inflammation. Many different things cause inflammation though. Diabetes. Diabetes, yes. Diabetes is characterized by chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else. And in fact, over 70% of people with type 2 diabetes die of cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease being a broad term encompassing strokes as well as heart attacks. Yes, correct, Stephen. If you don't do those, you stop the... If you don't do diabetes. Good, Stephen. If you don't do diabetes. ...of heart disease, of the narrowing. Yes, yes. Well, one could judiciously predict that, yes. Really, diet, stress control... Yes. ...exercise. Yes, exercise of the appropriate indicated kind for human physiology. I'm eyeing a device that actually employs that and imposes that on human beings. Let's see if you get that right later on. Will help not only stop the progression, but actually promote the regression or the opening up of the artery. One could judiciously predict, but not necessarily, in fact. Got to be very careful with your verbiage. One of those that's most important. Diet. Yes, diet. Stress control. Number one risk factor now for early death and disease in the United States and soon to be the world diet. No, not risk factor because risk is a cause and effect statement or word or term. I agree with that opinion, but you need to state it as an opinion because it is not a fact of reality like you just said necessarily. You can't prove that. It may very well be, and my opinion is that it is, but you cannot prove that with human nutrition science. There are no studies to inform upon the risk of any heart health outcome or disease process as that relates to any aspect of human nutrition over any given period of time throughout the entire time human nutrition science has existed. There never has been and there never will be. In order to do that, you need to perform an experiment on human beings. In order to do that, you have to take two genetically identical twins, phenotypically and genotypically identical, separate them at birth, put them into two metabolic ward lock-in rooms, observe them over their entire lives if attempting to infer lifelong health outcomes, 40 years for 40 year long health outcomes, etc., in control for every single variable, including the time they wake up, the time they go to bed, their stress levels, their hormone levels, the time they eat, and only change one variable, that being the one that you're studying. It's implausible for obvious reasons, but it's also unethical, wouldn't get past an ethics committee, and is also exorbitantly expensive. So no, we cannot establish cause and effect with human nutrition science. You derive cause and effect relationships from hard sciences, those being biochemistry slash human physiology, anatomy, and physics. Paleoanthropology we also use to make more judicious inferences, but even then, that's not even cause and effect, but it's more causal or indicative of causal relationships, let's say, just for the time being, than human nutrition sciences. So let's get rid of this word risk, Stephen. False, not risk factor. You are incorrect. It used to be smoking. Smoke. It's not like it changed, Tom. I guess you could say it's changed because of societal changes, but there's no evidence that smoking ever was a risk factor. That was an inference. I think it was quite a judicious inference, but that's my opinion. We need to separate opinions from facts, and that's the one error that you guys keep making. Uh, right, smoking was, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've covered that, Stephen. Yeah. 
they diet? Does that mean you have to become a vegetarian? to? Re- Absolutely not, because a vegetarian diet is, once again, to use the words auspicious and propitious. It's the most, or one of the most auspicious, propitious ways to developing such a condition, or at least exacerbating already pre-existing heart disease. Plants are inflammatory. They're not designed for human consumption. They never have been. Also, not to mention, when we're talking about diabetes, where do carbohydrates, which all break down to sugar, by the way, come from? Do they come from animal products? No, they fucking don't. Unless you're talking about certain dairy products, which, by the way, are still, even though they're carnivorous, slightly contraindicated, technically. Reverse this damage or... No. I'm no, going kind of broth, broth only from here on. <laughs> broth would actually be a better option than plant foods, in fact, because broth usually has saturated fat in it. Saturated fat being the main derivative of our effective energy, energy in quotes, because, well, we don't actually utilize energy. We use mass, not energy, for four and a half million years if you include protohumans that preceded a current speciation, that being Homo sapiens sapien. Fat in the form of saturated fat, straight hydrocarbon chains, biochemically speaking, the stuff solid room temperature, butter, tallow, lard, suet, and ghee, particularly. In fact, that is where we derived our effective fuel to perform work for four and a half million years. So that would actually be better than plants that contain polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids, and also a slew and a myriad of other plant toxins. Why do you think 99% of plants upon consumption out in the wild kill us upon impact? Once again, upon consumption. The only plants that we can eat without dying immediately upon consumption are plants that we've bred and grafted and hybridized for thousands of years in order to make them less toxic. And even then, they're still f***ing toxic. So no, you should never ever become a vegetarian ever under any circumstance. We are human beings. We're apex predators. If you look at an evolutionary food pyramid, carnivores at the top. So how the f*** would we be omnivores, let alone herbivores? No, no, you don't need to be a vegetarian, but it helps if you go more towards more plant-based. And there goes all your f***ing credibility, Stephen. No, it doesn't. In fact, Stephen, plants contain a slew of toxic compounds, particularly with regards to this discussion about heart disease that's most salient and relevant to heart disease. Oxalates, lectins. Shall I show a picture on the screen of what oxalates turn into within your body? They crystallize into raphides, which are smaller than your cell membranes and therefore obliterate your cells upon impact. 80% of all kidney stones are calcium oxalate crystals as well. Lectins are compounds found in grains. To make Potatoes, potatoes, bell peppers, hot peppers, squash, pumpkin, etc., 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 that utilize molecular mimicry on the domestic cells of the human body and therefore subsequently launch an immune response from the body, it will kill your own cells out of confusion. It is a direct cause of autoimmune disorders. This includes cells of the epithelial nature, Stephen, the ones that line your arteries. What does that do? That causes inflammation because, once again, inflammation is a pre programmed immune response, Stephen. Oxalates, those raphides that I was just talking about, they can deposit into your arterial walls, causing, oh, inflammation. So get rid of the plants. So in the Mediterranean diet that we've talked about here before. What the f*** is the Mediterranean diet, Stephen? Mediterranean diet is a vague term. There are many diets consumed in the Mediterranean region. Please specify explicitly what you are talking about. Four things that aren't vegetarian in it. Red meat. Yes, red meat is the primary constituent or should be the primary constituent of human beings' diets. Since it is our species-appropriate, species-specific food of choice, we evolved for four and a half million years deriving around 80% of our effective energy or food intake from primarily the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals, as established unequivocally and unambiguously by stable nitrogen and carbon isotope analyses conducted in 2019 on the collagen of the long bones of ancient human remains that established once again unequivocally that was the case. Cause and effect data right there. Suggested three ounces a day, a deck of carbs. Way too little. Way too little of an amount of red meat. That should make up the majority of your diet, the primary constituent, if not the exclusive constituent. Fish, you know, eat three or No, that should make up about 10% of your carnivorous diet. Any food that isn't red meat should make up about 10% of your carnivorous diet. Eggs can make up a little bit more than that if you really choose to do that. It's a week. A dairy products. Three times a week? Really, Stephen? I bet you're plant-based. No, I, I, I'm serious when I say that. I bet that he's plant-based. I would guarantee that this man is plant-based. We can tell by looking at you. 70% of the standard American diet is plant-based. In fact, a lot of people don't realize that. It's not vegan, but it's plant-based, for sure. You know, which is... Um... It's very limited, just like one pat of butter a day. Oh, goodness me. I eat a stick of butter a day with the fat that's already inherent in my red meat and eggs. Are you fucking kidding me, Stephen? This is the most anachronistic, antiquated viewpoint that I've ever heard. It is so trite and so banal and so insipid and vapid and bleak, Stephen. We are not in the 1950s anymore. Any excess cholesterol that one consumes is simply recycled and or excreted, as is indicated by that physiological system at that given instance in time, as long as that physiological system is operating and functioning properly. 
me, Stephen. No. And uh, things like poultry, white meat. Uh, no, poultry should not make up that much of your diet at all. We did not evolve to eat birds, Stephen. Not to mention the fact that the way in which we raise birds now, raise poultry, which is on their species inappropriate, species unspecific diet, causes them to have exorbitant levels of polyunsaturated fatty acids within their flesh. Polyunsaturated fatty acids causally lead to inflammation, biochemically speaking. It has to do with cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase enzymes. Okay, Stephen? So no, you should not be eating that. Red meat. Red Red ruminant animal meat, cow, bison, deer, elk, horse, sheep, mutton, lamb, pick one. Sheep, mutton, and lamb are the same animal. Your chicken, poultry. If you can eat mo most of your calories being planted. Calories are the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water around a closed thermodynamic system, also known as a bomb calorimeter by one degree Celsius, Stephen. To be informal, therefore, you would say that they're units of heat measurement or heat units. The human body doesn't absorb energy. It absorbs mass or matter. We don't absorb calories. The human being, every single human being on the face of the planet at this moment has a daily intake of calories necessarily at zero. So false, Stephen. No, you don't eat calories. You eat mass. Fruits. Vegetable. No, fruits contain exorbitant levels of sugar. All forms of it, in fact. Glucose, fructose, and sucrose, a disaccharide of glucose and fructose. It also contains sorbitol, a sugar alcohol, which causes cells to burst because of its osmotic force. Legumes. No, legumes, lectins, fiber. And then whole grains, no, absolutely not. Lectins, oxalates, fiber, phytates even, which causally lead to nutrient deficiencies by binding particularly to zinc and iron, but not zinc and iron from meat. That's interesting. If you're a plant-based eater, phytates will definitely be a problem for you. Get full on that stuff and add in a little... That stuff, that amalgam of slop, is that what you mean? That odious nonsense, Stephen? Is that what you're talking about? Because if that's the case, if that's what you mean by stuff, then yeah, stuff is what it is. But no, you shouldn't get full on it. If you get full on it every day, people will be more inclined to look like you, carrying quite an abundant amount of adiposity, Stephen. So stop pontificating as if you know anything about how to attain or achieve optimal body composition. You dolt. These other things. It's Ice okay. cream. Uh, it's the, that's the dairy. Uh, you can have <laughs> low fat or no fat yogurt. Yeah. yeah, because fat is the culprit. Holy sh**. We are lost. We are f***ing lost. No. Fat is our primary energy source. Always has been. Little but no, bit. No ice cream. <laughs> also, ice cream shouldn't really be eaten in reality because of the sugar. But if you make it yourself using basically just heavy cream, egg yolks, vanilla extract, some salt, and a little bit of sugar, it's not really the worst thing in the world. Just don't overdo the sugar. I'm not dogmatic. Every single gram of carbohydrate that you consume is contraindicated and insalubrious. But let's be realistic here and pragmatic and practical. You're going to have some. Just make sure that it's not too much. Well, if you're doing lots of the other things too, that's the balance part. If you're doing the exercising and... No, you can't outrun a bad diet, Tracy, ma'am. <laughs> the way that these people are talking, they're making it the most anodyne, the most unlikely to provoke dissent or offense. And it's really, really annoying because people need to know the hard truth. It's like you're talking to children. It's patronizing, whether you realize that or not. But no, diet is the number one thing to control in terms of optimizing body composition and hedging against deleterious manifestations of disease. Ding. I don't know, blood sugar levels, all of Blood sugar levels is the most important thing out of anything that you've listed in terms of what to mitigate and control with respect to having the most auspicious approach to having a healthy manifestation of physiology, or in other words, having not an insalubrious manifestation of disease. Because if you didn't know, sugar causally exacerbates cancer, number one. You have to be very careful with the word cause. It does causally exacerbate cancer. The discoverer of that little phenomenon literally won the Nobel Peace Prize in the 1920s for that. Otto Warburg. It's called the Warburg effect. Look into it. But also, glucose itself is a six carbon aldehyde, and aldehydes, even in vastly small concentrations, destroy lipid rafts, tear cell membranes to pieces, bind to DNA to promote carcinogenesis by causing mutations to it, and in a high enough concentration but still relatively low, kills cells outright. What do you think that causes, folks? Inflammation, maybe? The underpinning cause of heart disease? And every major killer in the United States, in the Western world, in fact? It's all important. And once again, over 70% of type 2 diabetics die of cardiovascular disease. Why do you think that is? It's all important. No, we're, well, not. Not the plant-based diet part. And the two big things, of course, are the uh, the nutrition and the... Yes, but you don't know anything about that. Next. Size. But the two... The exercise, as long as it's of the appropriate indicated kind, and typically your coterie decides to promote the worst kind of exercise, that being steady state, moderate intensity, long-term cardiovascular exercise, or what is colloquially deemed cardio exercise, which is contraindicated in the extreme. Look up hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, please. Also not to mention, look up hormones and how they adapt and acclimate to environmental stressors and externalities.
that Americans have forgotten about. And it's you. Oh, you haughty, arrogant f is, is stress and social support. And that's ancillary. That's subsidiary. That is not the primary thing to focus on. That is not the primary factor. Next. Sleep. They all sleep, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, everybody's under stress. Don't worry about it. And I don't get much sleep. I'm never am gonna, so don't worry about that either. Yeah, not a good way to think. Don't do that. He's right about that. Those two are huge because they don't allow you to have resiliency and come back. Okay, resilience, not resiliency. Come on, Steven. Change your lifestyle and make you... In and lower your stress level. So your heart can be healthier if you get better sleep and reduce your stress. They yeah. almost unequivocally will. In fact, actually, it's not necessarily really the amount of sleep that you get. It also it depends on the quality, REM sleep. There's different stages of sleep. No doubt about that. No <laughs> doubt, yeah, I agree. Uh, cholesterol, do we still? No, cholesterol is not causal in heart disease. One should refer to the largest associative data set ever aggregated by the British Heart Foundation and the World Health Organization working independently from each other, in which they measured the total cholesterol and LDL levels for people in 168 different countries. These are several hundred million data points around the world. And on the other axis, plotted the age-adjusted death rates per 100,000 persons per year versus their cholesterol level. And what they found was that the lower your total cholesterol number was, or level was, below 220 milligrams per deciliter, the higher the incidence of deaths were from all causes and from every subcause including heart disease, strokes, and cancer. Now, one should also understand that association does not equate to causality. However, if there is an inverse association or an absent association as compared to the previously hypothesized association that would be seen, then causality can and should be dismissed. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Sorry about that. Well, cholesterol, uh, the guidelines have come out and there'll be a new paper probably soon that'll say- Who gives a f about the guidelines. The bought and paid for guidelines by rapacious cupidinous charlatans. Who is even looking at those now? After what happened in 2015, after what was released in 2015 by the Journal American Medical Association that literally showed internal documentation from the Sugar Research Foundation themselves, from the UCSF, talking about how sugar contributed to heart disease, and then them, in their own words and documentation, paying off three Harvard professors to falsify data and manipulate papers to show that cholesterol caused heart disease. After we saw that, why would we ever trust you guys ever again? Why would we ever look at your guidelines? Cholesterol isn't that important. They said that a couple of years ago. It's not only not that important. It isn't important, Stephen. And all the press picked up on was that. Why so, are we looking at what the press says? Appeal to consensus. Appeal to authority as well. Not only should you not care, you should do the opposite of what they say. Not important. If they would read the article, it would say... <laughs> oh my gosh, you Dunning-Kruger sufferer. Look at you. As if you know how to interpret raw data. <laughs> what you read was a conclusion written by authors, which means it was an opinion written by authors, Stephen. If you're in this space, you're almost definitely aware of all of the comments that are made about the toxins in bottled water and especially tap water, so I'll save you the time on that. What almost always goes unappreciated, however, is the fact that you only absorb 15% of all water, no matter what kind it is, bottled, filtered, or tap. There is a way to fix this, however, and it's with a particular machine that makes water molecules that are much smaller than regular water molecules, so small, in fact, that it makes tea on impact with a tea bag without the need for boiling that water. This makes makes it 600% more hydrating than regular water, which of course will help with many health conditions, as it hydrates your cells more efficiently and more effectively than any other water that you can find. If you want to know more about this machine, like where to buy it, how it works, and also how it can replace your dish soap and sanitizer by emulsifying and mixing with oil, refer to the links in the description below. That we eat so much saturated fat and animal fat and no, we fucking don't. For example, red meat consumption, a strong source or significant source of saturated fat from the course of 1977 to 1980, three years time after the 1977 USDA guidelines came out that discouraged the consumption of fat and cholesterol since they caused heart disease, went down by over 18% and has been steadily declining ever since, in fact. The consumption of plants is going up, Stephen. We don't eat that much saturated fat, Stephen. Plant fat in this country. No one's really eating that much saturated plant fat, Stephen. Really? Come on. The cholesterol we take in isn't as important as it used to be. So How does that make any sense? Why would that be their assertion? The entire reason that saturated fat was denigrated in the first place was due to its propensity to raise cholesterol, cholesterol being the reductionary culprit and the inappropriately maligned substance within such a facile argument that cholesterol causes heart disease and all that. So why would it be that since we eat so much saturated fat that cholesterol is no longer as important? The only reason why cholesterol was important was because of its supposed propensity to be risen as a result of saturated fat consumption. He's either misrepresenting the conclusion or the conclusion just didn't make any f***ing sense. How to cut down both the cholesterol and the saturated fat. No, you should not do any such thing. In fact, even if cholesterol were causal in heart disease, dietary cholesterol has very little impact on blood cholesterol. But you still believe in statins for people who have a...
Oh, statins are absolute mitochondrial poisons. They damage the CoQ enzymes within your electron transport chain within the mitochondrial membrane, therefore causally leading to inflammation. Cholesterol, or are you more suggesting that it can be controlled with diet? It, in most patients, it can be controlled with diet, but... It can be reduced with diet if you don't administer the proper amount of cholesterol or allow the intake of proper amount of cholesterol within the body, making it destitute and bereft of adequate nutrition to actually create cholesterol itself and actually get itself to the optimal indicated cholesterol level that it would like to get to via homeostatic mechanisms. You can do that, but if you're trying to raise your cholesterol, eventually it caps off because cholesterol levels are regulated by your genes and nothing else, by the way. Your genes having evolved for billions of years at least. <sighs> pretty radical change, and we ask them to migrate. No, not pretty radical. Unless you're starving them of cholesterol, then yes, it can lower. And also, if you take statins, yes, it can lower them too. Not indicated at all. The association between statin usage and ALS, an invariably neurologically fatal condition, is around 11,000%, which, just to put that into perspective, is around the same association that you'll see, the same strength of an association that you'll see within populations that smoke and presentations within those populations of lung cancer new diet over one to two years because you can't okay not one to two years six to eight weeks that's way too long and that's a microbiome thing so statins have been around for a long time and there are a lot of people yes you should look into the history of statins as well a russian scientist force-fed rabbits pure cholesterol and saw that they developed heart disease that was his hypothesis of the atherosclerosis lipid heart hypothesis basis that was the basis for it forget the fact that we're not rabbits and forget the fact that the presentation of atherosclerosis within those rabbits was different than that that is presented within people that have atherosclerosis in human populations completely omit that detail he decided to make statins as a result and here we are statins mm -hmm. still right right um any long-term side effects that you've identified yes in fact in fact one in five 20 percent of patients cannot tolerate statin medication at a moderate regular dose which is astounding considering the fact that these people within these populations would be willing to withstand and sustain mild statin side effects if they thought it would help them live longer which indicates that these side effects that discourage and disallow them from actually embarking on such a statin administration journey are more than mild you know, we've, uh, we have found uh, that it can lead to increased incidence of diabetes. Yes, because of the inflammation that it induces due to its CoQ enzyme effects. But it's usually an earlier occurrence of diabetes than if you weren't on the statin. So if oh you my God. That is not true because you're citing an association. What happens, and the reason that association even exists in the first place, is because not only does the doctor prescribe a statin, they also tell them to change their diet. You can ameliorate diabetes with a plant-based diet. In fact, that is a way of doing it, even though it's full of sugar. It's because of the downregulation of the Randall cycle that occurs. It's not because sugar is good and fat is bad. Fat doesn't raise your glucose levels. It necessarily does not in isolation. It doesn't raise your insulin in isolation. Are obese, have high fasting blood sugar, have metabolic syndrome, the big pump. Metabolic syndrome is a construct or a concept. It is a diagnosis predicated upon other proxy measures. It is not in and of itself a problem or disease process. You can't measure if someone is metabolically deranged via a metabolic syndrome meter. It's the same situation with insulin resistance, by the way, which he'll get to. Don't worry. Uh, you'll go into become a diabetic about three months earlier than if you weren't on the statin. Not necessarily. That's an association, Stephen Kopecki. For every one patient gets diabetes, five heart attacks are prevented. No, prevented is a cause and effect statement, and we just covered that earlier in the f***ing video. You can't use sensational language like risk and chance and cause and effect. You can't use those correctly and appropriately when referring to human nutrition science because it can't be established, Stephen Kopecki. You're using this language to aggrandize yourself in the perception of very impressionable people. You shill. I heard that term metabolic syndrome. Yeah. yeah. A construct next a lot and it's difficult to understand for uh, it's difficult to understand when people meretriciously convolute it like Stephen in order to once again aggrandize themselves in the perception of other impressionable people us and our <laughs> listeners <laughs> yes. explain that for yeah. us will you? metabolic, metabolic syndrome. syndrome has five facts yeah explain it elucidate it go ahead what the no main... it's predicated upon five proxy measures and it doesn't have five factors it's a big punch big no that's not the number one characteristic of it that's a side effect of poor dietary input Obesity is a side effect.
it isn't in and of itself the problem. It can perpetuate problems once it's developed. That is something that does need to be said. Different dietary inputs will redound to that. Then it can perpetuate already pre-existing issues like chronic inflammation. Obesity, which is a very active fat. It puts out chemicals that are bad for us. It makes there you go. It can result in a catch-22 situation if you remain chronically overweight or obese, in which your fat cells themselves exude pro-inflammatory signals, which inflammation is required in order to store fat. Because in order for the body to assume a fat storing mode, it requires the phosphorylation of pro-inflammatory cytokines within your mitochondria. If you are obese, you are necessarily invariably inflamed to a certain degree as a result of that biochemical phenomenon. So what can happen is when you actually get your hormones in balance to actually start losing fat, when your body starts to oxidize that fat, fat is not only released from those cells, pro-inflammatory signals are as well, which perpetuates the obesity status, and it's just a round and round feedback loop paradoxical circle that can result. That in many cases does need ameliorating, and if you want some assistance in ameliorating that phenomenon, please click the link that's on the screen now, Cerule Products, and check out my video on Cerule Products that will also be linked below in the description for more information on that. That's the best approach to ameliorating that as quickly as possible, right after adopting a properly tenured, properly fortified carnivorous diet. Or insulin resistant. Insulin Wait. resistance is also a construct cover that. There is no insulin resistance meter. You can't measure that. It's based upon proxy measures. Women going through menopause, that's where you're likely to gain weight. Yeah. Women going through, yeah, sure. Okay. Women in general tend to store more fat than men because of their biological signals and what they're encoded to do and how they're encoded to perform. It's for childbearing purposes, of course, and child rearing purposes. It's really a higher risk factor okay. for them. No, not risk factor covered that, Stephen. Stop using that word now. Uh, second is blood pressure that's elevated. Third. Yes, that's typically the result of an elevated or upregulated, rather, Randall cycle situation, which is the result of consuming fat and carbohydrates together. Omit the carbohydrates, you usually don't get that. It is a result of inflammation. The low HDL or low good cholesterol that cleans Okay, up. there's no such thing as good cholesterol or bad cholesterol. There are different lipoproteins that carry cholesterol throughout the body, those being LDL, HDL, chylomicrons, IDL, and SDLDL, and VLDL. There's many, in fact, Stephen. Okay, HDL and LDL aren't cholesterol. There's no such thing as LDL or HDL cholesterol, Stephen. They're lipoproteins that carry cholesterol throughout the body. There's just one cholesterol molecule, the inappropriately maligned molecule, still to this day. Lest we forget what cholesterol is important for in the body. It's important for interrupting communication between pathogenic bacteria via a process called quorum sensing. It makes it 20% of your brain. It makes it 40 to 50% of all the cell membranes in all of the trillions of cells in your body. It's important for cell membrane fluidity as it makes your cells more resilient because it functions as glue, to be informal, between the phospholipids and the phospholipid bilayer of your cell membranes. It's important for vitamin D synthesis and utilization within the body. It's important for nutrient absorption since it's a constituent of bile salts. Get a grip, Stephen. It makes up the backbone of five major hormone groups, those being glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, androgens, estrogens, and progestogens. Give me a break, Stephen. The arteries. And then the, uh, um, the other thing would be uh, uh, things like uh, blood pressure and... Um, and um, 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 and, uh, and uh, you already said blood pressure, Stephen. You already said it. What are the other two? Uh, the uh, Those are the factors that really... Leak. So you can't even get them. So you can't even get all five. Holy sh**. More inflammation. And if you... No, plants cause more inflammation, actually. So yes, blood pressure, yes, sure. Abrasions. I gave that hint in the beginning. Abrasions, sure, you're right. But you forgot to mention that plants do that too. Roll those that you're much better off. And where do carbohydrates come from, by the way? Plants. I heard you talk about fish oil before, and as I recall... Oh, give me a break. ...a proponent. Of course he is, because he's a f***ing shill and a moron. He's an ignoramus, a rapacious ignoramus. I, I want to know if you still are, and is that... An obsequious ass, by the way, as well. Obsequious as f*** to the medical establishment. Everybody, or is that just for people with heart disease? No, it shouldn't be for anyone. Fish oils contain exorbitant amounts of aldehydes, which are the oxidation products from rancid fats. They causally lead to inflammation, even in small amounts. I already talked about aldehydes and what they do even in small amounts. Well, it, fish oil helps a lot of people. It helps is a cause and effect word. There's no evidence to support that claim. If that's your opinion, state it as such. And in fact, if that is your opinion, it is jejune, superficial, naive, and simplistic people with heart disease. You know, recent studies show that high dose fish oil or a study show. You haven't heard that one before, have you? Studies show studies that you're citing because apparently you know how to interpret science. F me, Stephen. EPA specifically is Yes, icosapentaenoic acid. What about it? Type of EPA which is the thing you find on the bottle when you buy in the store. Yes, and it's also found in sufficient and adequate amounts in ruminant meat. EPA, yes. Icosapentaenoic acid. Usually combined whenever you see it on food labels with DHA, docosahexaenoic acid, in fact. Yeah, we got it. Reduce uh, heart attacks if you... Reduce is a cause and effect term. Covered that. High triglycerides. High tri... <sighs> F*** me. That was an association that you saw. Even if your LDL is controlled. 
controlled by what your genes because that's what they're controlled by you can't control your ldl you can just make your body completely bereft and destitute of cholesterol by giving it the inappropriate amount of cholesterol exogenously which would be very low amounts that would be the inappropriate thing to do yes you can control it that way but still that's that's determined by your genes it lowers it itself really it physiologically acclimates to such a low introduction of cholesterol that's really what i meant all right, a drug called Vasipa just read that the FDA approved an expanded use. Just another reason why you shouldn't be taking it because the FDA is fraudulent. They're rapacious, cupidinous, evil, misanthropic individuals composed primarily of charlatans. Do you know how drugs get approved through the FDA? Maybe I should make a video about that. That'll make you think twice about FDA approval. It's fish oil drug. Do you use right. it? That's the one. That's Vasipa. the EPA. That's the V-A-S-C-E-P-A is how it's spelled. And that's the one that they approved, and that's the one that showed benefit. No, nope. benefits, cause and effect term. Next. When it comes to fish and fish oil, uh, if you don't like fish and you're trying to do the Mediterranean mm -hmm. diet, but you're not... Just find what the Mediterranean diet is. You haven't covered that yet. Fish. Mm -hmm. Does fish oil take its place, or is that something that you would want to use both of them? No, you wouldn't want to use any of them, really. But if you're going to choose, you want to choose the fish because it's real food. But even then, any meat that isn't ruminant red meat should constitute around 10% of your carnivorous diet maximum. That includes fish. And fish oil. Well, you'd like, ideally, to use both of them. Yeah. No... Stephen, you're driving me mad. It's better to have the fish and you know, there's no pill that replaces lifestyle. Correct, but you're also a shill for pills that you say would help ameliorate certain conditions when in reality people never get off of them and also typically they perpetuate illness, which is one of the reasons why they never get off of them. <laughs> and you profit off of it. So I don't even know why you're saying that. You're saying that in order to be an ostensibly better figure in the perception of other impressionable people, other naive people, or desperate people. People are desperate to hear advice, and they get advice from this charlatan, this fool, this haughty, pompous, arrogant, pretentious fool. The Mediterranean diet is more than just a diet, it's a lifestyle. Well, it's not even a diet, because you didn't specify what the f the Mediterranean diet even f***ing is. Also, this is treacly. Treacly nonsense. Give me a break, Stephen. Stop by the store on the way home. Pick up the, uh, the fish. Fresh. Take it home. Take a while to cook it. Sit for a couple hours with your family as you eat it and talk about the day. Uh, vomit. Give me a break. Just, you know, eat it on the way to the <laughs> soccer game or something. All right, aspirin. Baby aspirin. Who should be taking it? You still uh, think it's a preventive for people who have had... It's not a preventative. Holy shit. Aspirin reduces the clotting of blood and reduces some acute inflammatory mediators via the cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase enzymes, particularly, once again, the cyclooxygenase enzyme. You don't want to be taking too much of it. It's much, 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 much better than Tylenol, though, with Tylenol's main ingredient being acetaminophen, a compound that is completely unknown mechanism-wise and how it functions within the body. No one knows how it works. No one knows. We do know how aspirin works, but the way in which it works is by utilizing a plant compound called salicylic acid. And if you take too much of that, you can cause and induce liver damage because it's a plant compound, a plant toxin. Plants should be used medicinally, but to rely on it as a preventative, quote unquote, Dr. Tom, give me a break. Heart disease or have heart disease? Yeah, if you have had heart disease, aspirin is beneficial. There's no... How the fuck do you know that? You're referring to studies that claim beneficial effect from aspirin use, which is irresponsible, Stephen. I've covered this. There's no uh, argument about that unless you have bleeding problems from it. I wonder why people would have bleeding problems from it. Maybe because it prevents the blood from clotting, Stephen? It reduces thromboxane production, TXA2 particularly, I'm pretty sure. Not as helpful as we used to think it was. You have to be a higher risk for a heart attack over the next 10 years, 10, 12, 15% risk. Those people... Bloviating, loquacious fuck. But the average person, which is lower, like 7, 8% risk, they, they probably wouldn't benefit. You can't... You cannot interpret science. Raw data would leave you clueless. You would gop at it. Does it work? Uh, it stops the uh, inflammation in the lining of the arteries, and it also it, stops the blood clot formation in the lining of the artery. Yes, it does do that. It does prevent the clot, yes. Not necessarily the blockage, though. It does help. If you are having a heart attack, choose some baby aspirin. That's what I say. And if you already have heart disease, aspirin can help in your journey of embarking upon ameliorating such a condition. Yes, fine. Don't take too much. Exercise is something that you're supposed to do. I think that can be in intimidating for people. It's intimidating to indolent people, especially people in my generation, Gen Z. It's intimidating to them because they're, once again, indolent. They're lazy. They're overly languid.
they exercise is what a patient needs to do. What does that mean? Yeah, it means to exert yourself strenuously, laboriously, using and employing proper indicated variable resistance training. No colloquial cardio to speak of because that's contraindicated. It leads to a higher propensity for one to store onto fat actually and reduces musculature actively. Physical activity is why I've gone to more because exercise they kind of fold across their arms and you know and look at the ceiling. <laughs> and physical activity is two things. One, don't be sedentary. Every Good. Correct. Good job, Stephen. One point. Hour. Get up and move around for three or four minutes. A lot of the big... Okay, that's not enough. I know you're doing that in order to be anodyne. Again, not likely to provoke dissent or offense. Inoffensive, often deliberately so. I know that. But give people the hard truth. Corporations around this country and the world now have a thing every hour where you get up and you move around. So go up two floors. That's not enough. Go to the bathroom. Go talk to a, a colleague instead of sending him an email. That's not enough. Climbing up the stairs, like you just said, that's fine. But you can't do it just one time. The second thing is intense physical activity, which is... Yes, what I just laid out. You used to do a lot of. When you do intense activity, three great things happen very quickly. One is the heart is told to pump more blood because the muscles say, hey, we're running from the saber-toothed tiger. We got to try to survive. <laughs> If you're doing the wrong kinds of exercise, though, it leads to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, inappropriate hypertrophy of the heart muscle. So it's not necessarily always a good thing. Second thing is the blood vessels get bigger, which lower yeah. blood pressure. And the third thing is the muscle... Over time lowers blood pressure, yes. Okay, okay belly fat, you're up next. If we not necessarily. If you upregulate your cortisol and downregulate your testosterone and growth hormone by doing cardio exercise, you'll do the opposite while also simultaneously upregulating your appetite. Vibe this run from the saber tooth tiger. I need more energy because I only have 20 minutes of energy in my cell. You, you don't have energy in your body. The only energy that our body is even dealing with is the insensible loss of heat energy due to entropy after the exothermic reactions are effectuated within the body. Our body doesn't absorb energy and it also doesn't store energy. It absorbs and stores mass, which is not the same thing. Breaking down and sending me extra energy because that's where we put it. And that's not me being trivially captious, by the way. That's important. Calories are nonsense. Calories is an adult. So it's the... We don't store calories. Like I just said, we don't store calories. In dream, I call it. You can actually, we've shown here with research, you can reduce abdominal fat. You don't do research. What are you, why are you saying we? We've shown with research. You have not shown that. With interval activity. All right, one final question. Also, once again, cause and effect statement. That is not the science that you should be using to derive cause and effect statements from. False, Stephen. You cannot make that assertion with the science that you are citing. False. From the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, mm -hmm. the smart guys, the heart guys, these people are not the smart guys. They're charlatans. Researchers have found that eating chili peppers regularly can <laughs> cut the risk of death from heart disease and stroke. Risk. Already invalidated the entire thing. That was the number one read article last <laughs> year in the Jack. And so okay, funny, haha. Ha. Appeal to consensus and also sort of appeal to authority in a way. Appeal to popularity. It is true, and it's funny about it. It's not, it's not true, Stephen. Are you f kidding me someone needs to revoke your license as a physician you are dangerous to the public it's regular bell peppers these are hot peppers which are even worse because if you didn't know the spicy sensation that one feels from eating peppers is capsaicin a lectin which causally leads to inflammation even if acute it is a toxin that the plant produced in order to discourage predators predators including us from eating them because plants are living things and need to discourage other predators from eating them because they need to survive they just don't have eyes and a mouth and they're rooted to the ground and can't move. And this was in addition to a Mediterranean diet. No, it wasn't because a Mediterranean diet is not a diet. It needs to be explicitly defined and you have not done so. So, and they say, why? Well, maybe it's inflammation. It didn't, didn't affect inflammation. No, it did impact inflammation, even if acute. It had to have necessarily, biochemically, those induce and cause inflammation. Stephen, capsaicin is a plant toxin, particularly a lectin, and that's what it does. Uh, maybe it's vasodilatation because you get hot. Vasodilation, not dilatation. Get your grammar right too. That's the Second error I've noticed and pounced on this video. Blood pressure goes down. It didn't affect that. What it looks like it may be uh, some of the antioxidants that are in there. Plant antioxidants are only antioxidants for the plant and not for human beings. They're actually pro-oxidants for human beings, which is why our glutathione status goes up after consuming them in order to mitigate the oxidative damage that results from those antioxidants, not because they're functioning as antioxidants within us. Me, Stephen. Can you get anything right in this video? Some of these peppers have more. All right, can't argue with that. Wow. Yes, you can, and I just did, Tom. Uh, Tracy, what the wow, really? It's just manufactured.
peer-reviewed journal. <laughs> Heart dizzy. Peer-reviewed does not mean correct. A bunch of indoctrinated peers reviewing another indoctrinated peer's research is not conferring of veracity, necessarily. Far and away, the number one killer of both men and women in this country, CAD, coronary artery disease, is usually the culprit. Lifestyle changes can help prevent it, and it can actually be reversed. And don't forget the chili peppers. No. no, forget the chili peppers. Well, don't forget that they induce inflammation, and inflammation is the underpinning etiology behind not only heart disease, but every single major killer in the entirety of the Western world. Don't forget that part. Their lifestyle recommendations, their dietary recommendations, all completely fallacious, erroneous. Do not follow it. It's dangerous. Do not listen to these people, these miscreants, these misanthropes, these charlatans. Our thanks to Dr. Stephen Kopetsky. No, no thank you, Stephen. Cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic. Thanks, Dr. Kopetsky. Cardiologist, there you go. That should scare the shit out of you because it scares the shit out of me. Cardiologist, folks. Anyway, that was nonsense just like usual. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, leave your comments below. Also, most importantly, subscribe to my Patreon. I have a $1 a month tier, a $5 a month tier, and an $8 a month tier in order to receive access to ad-free content, one week early uploads, one extra upload per week, uncensored content, and depending on the cut and depending on how much time I actually want to employ, extended cut content. Also, buy my book when it's out. March 1st is what we're aiming for. Contraindicated, a closer look and revision of mainstream health axioms that are perpetuated illness, disorder, and disease for over a century by the ebook, by the hardcover, by the paperback, or by the audiobook recorded all by my own voice. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, slash X, TikTok. All those links will be linked in the description below. Also email me edgoki14 at gmail.com. That will also be linked below for any questions that you may have. Or if you would like to recommend that I react to a certain video in particular, I will try and get to that. But I'm operating under a stash that I have stowed for a year, really, in my abditory of videos. And so I have a surplus of them. So I'm working with that at the moment. But anyway, with that being said, join me next time when we react to another charlatan that views themselves as remotely competent to speak upon the areas of human nutrition science, biochemistry, physiology, anatomy, etc, etc. So, till then.